Okay. Good morning. My Good morning. My name is Chelsea Moreno, and today is February 20th, 2017. I'm interviewing Dr. Juliette Garcia for the Voces Oral History Project at the University of Texas at Austin. We are in Austin. Thank you, Dr. Garcia, for agreeing to be interviewed. Please know that if there are any topics you don't wish to discuss, you will not have to discuss them. Also, if there's something you wish to discuss, we want to hear from you. So if at any point um, you wish to stop the camera to get a drink or use the facilities, please let us know. As we said earlier, your interview will be housed at the Nettie Lee Benson Library at the University of Texas at Austin campus. Okay, so let's begin. Dr. Garcia, um, can you tell me what it was like for you growing up in Brownsville, Texas? Uh, it was a wonderful um, place to grow up. Brownsville was a smaller town than um, I grew up. I was born in 49, so I grew up there in the 50s. And, um, and really within a couple of blocks, um, all of our significant um, institutions um, resided. So uh, our church was a couple of blocks from our home. Our school, our, from, from uh, kindergarten to elementary to high school. Our stores were down the street um, and downtown. We lived off of downtown. And so, um, and, a, and a little park uh, with a fountain, uh, all was there. So it was really a very, um, it was a lovely place to grow up. Um, can you describe the culture of Brownsville? Brownsville, very um, international. And um, so we are um, uh, maybe uh, five blocks from the river uh, to Mexico. So going to Matamoros was a, a ritual and a, and a habit uh, there in Brownsville. So everybody grew up. I thought everybody in the world was bilingual until I left the valley and discovered that they weren't. Um, uh, and so my father was from Monterrey. My mother was from Harlingen. So we spoke both languages. Uh, and, um, and, and it seemed like most people did, whether for um, school uh, well, not in school. We were not allowed to speak uh, Spanish in school at all. But um, in our communities, we spoke both languages. Interesting. So you mentioned your um, parents briefly. Um, can you tell me a little bit more about them? My, uh, my father came over from uh, Mexico, um, was born in Monterrey, and then grew up in Camargo. And um, during the Mexican Revolution, his father uh, was on the wrong side of the revolution, and so they had to flee their homes. And um, uh, there was a passport picture that I saw once with my grandmother, grandfather, and the four children all in one passport picture, looking very sad, um, uh, having to leave the security and, and knowledge of their home. Um, and so came over with nothing, uh, essentially, um, and then started their lives here in, the, in, in Brownsville. Um, my mother's family uh, was a pioneer family from Harlingen. Um, my grandfather had the first mercantile store in downtown Harlingen. My grandmother was the first English teacher uh, in the city of Harlingen. Mexicana, Margarita Villarreal, but was the English teacher. And, um, and, um, and so they met somewhere in between, San Benito, which is in between Brownsville and Harlingen. Um, so um, uh, everybody spoke both languages. Everybody lived in, in the, uh, across the border, in essence, straddling the border. So um, can you tell me about your parents' expectations for you um, growing up? Did they expect you to go to college? They're, they they're very clear um, expectations. My mother um, had graduated from high school in Harlingen as salutatorian, meaning that she almost was the highest ranked student in her class uh, and the only uh, Latina in the graduating class from Harlingen High School and the only Latina to graduate with honors. <clears throat> but but missed being valedictorian by a fraction of a point. And so the story in our family, told by my father dramatically every time um, uh, and retold uh, often, was that there was no way a Mexicana was going to be valedictorian at Harlingen High School at that time. 
Mother was not bitter, though. She just used that as an example of how we needed to be smarter and more prepared because um, and, and, life was going to be tough. My father um, went to Brownsville High School and also had high expectations. Both of them wanted to go to college, um, and they, but they graduated in the 30s, right in the middle of the Depression. And so neither of them were able to go on to college. They had both done well in high school. My father uh, uh, had done exceptionally well, too. So they, they um, transferred all of their hopes and expectations to their children, my two brothers and myself, and, um, and said, you're going to college, and, and you're going to do everything we were not able to do. So it was, a very, it was sad to watch them um, not be able to fulfill their own, um, their own abilities. Um, so I read, Dr. Garcia, that you lost your mother at um, a very young age. Mm -hmm. um, can you tell me about that? Um, mother uh, was diagnosed with cancer when she was nursing my younger brother. And, um, and then for the next five years had surgeries. And in those days, they didn't know what to do except cut. And, and, uh, and MD Anderson was just opening up in Houston. So, so cancer was still very much, uh, cure for cancer was very much in its infancy. So um, mother d uh, died at the age of 40. And um, uh, so we, uh, my older brother was 11, I was nine, and my younger brother was um, uh, five. Um, what would you say, would you say that this had, um, what kind of influence would you say that this had on you? Well, I mean, you can imagine, right? I mean, it was, it was a horrendous time. But our father decided to become mother and father. And so, you know, um, as I've said, angels abound, right? So he was, he was one. And he sat us down one day right after mother, not right after, but maybe a few weeks after mother had passed. And we were still kind of confused and didn't know how we were going to make things work without her. And <clears throat> so, so he said, how was your day today? And I said, well, we were fine, Dad. He said, did you eat? And we all said, yes. And he said, uh, did you go to school? And we, we thought, poor Dad. You know, I said, I don't know, but something's wrong with Dad. And we said, yes, Dad, we went to school. And he goes, you feel healthy and you're... You look fine. And we said, yes, sir, we, we're fine. And he said, you're survivors. You have survived the hardest thing that any person will ever endure, and that's the loss of your mother. You're stronger now. You are survivors. Nothing that ever comes your way, nothing will ever be harder than this moment. And so he strengthened us. And we didn't always feel strong, and we still to this day, I'm sure, have our moments. But, but instead of instead of um, um, making us feel like victims of something, he said quite the opposite. And so I think it, was, it served us well um, for in our entire lives. Thank you for sharing that. Mm -hmm. So can you describe your elementary school education experience? Mother was determined we were going to be brilliant, right? And so every one of us had to be very smart. That was her goal. And it didn't matter what you looked like. It didn't matter if you ran really fast or if you could throw a ball or not. But you had to be smart and you had to excel. And um, so she had sent us to kindergarten, my older brother and myself, to learn English because we spoke Spanish at home. So when I, it was my turn to go to first grade, I um, was given a test and passed this test. My brothers always said it was just whether I could color within the lines, but that's not true. Uh, but anyway, I passed some tests that uh, indicated that I should skip first grade. And so another young uh, uh, girl and myself, her name was Cynthia Miller, and I both passed this test and were automatically put into second grade. So came home from school, told my mother uh, that I was now in second grade. She said, pero como puede ser, you just started first grade. And I said, well, Mom, you know, explained it to her. The problem was they put me in a Spanish-speaking second grade. In those days, they were, they were um, very clear about uh, the, the Mexicanos would go here, the, the Anglos would go to another classroom. And we had been told not to speak Spanish in school. So um, the kids would make fun of me because they would call me agringada. It's the first time I'd ever heard that term. 
and and it was not it was not a nice term. It was pejorative, and it was meant to indicate that you were trying to be like the Anglo. And so, um, um, mother went with me. To, so she said, "What do you want me to do?" And I said, "I want to go back to first grade, and be in the English speaking class because that's what you want me." So anyway, mother goes to school and tells the principal that I. Uh, I should be moved back to first grade, but in the English speaking class, uh, so I can practice my English. Because mother was determined that that's what was going to make the path for us smooth. And the principal said, "No, she has to stay in second grade, and she stays, but she stays in the Spanish speaking class." And my mother says something like, "And but Cynthia Miller got put into the English speaking class." And lady said, "Well, you know, but there was room for her." So she went home, told the story to my father. My father went to the school the next day, made the same request, got the same response. And then he said, then you leave me no choice but then to tell the Brownsville Herald at the time what you've done to my daughter. And the story got better with every retelling, but the story was that this principal chased my father down the hall of the school and said, Mr. Villarreal, Villarreal is my maiden name, Mr. Villarreal, Mr. Villarreal, uh, we're going to find room for your daughter in the second grade English speaking class. So it, it was very important, I think, to have learned that lesson very young and to hear that story over and over because it was of advocacy. It was of your parents being your advocates. And, um, and so I ended up in second grade. English speaking classroom with a marvelous angel teacher, Miss Alexander, who taught us, um, bought us tickets to the community concerts. So I saw Cynthia and I. She decided these poor little girls, kind of outside of the norm, needed extra help. And so she taught us how to dress, uh, took us to these concerts. So I saw my first opera, La Boheme, in second grade. But more than see it, she taught it to us and set us up as close as she could find to the front row. And Cynthia on one side and me on the other, and, and she would just walk us through the opera. So, so she launched us in a, in a very important way successfully. So I enjoyed my elementary school years at that point. I did well, and, um, and my mother was happy about that. Can you tell me how um, these experiences that you mentioned translate, translated to your decision to go to college? Um, it, I was in fifth grade when mother died, and so um, I knew that because she, just because she wasn't there, it didn't change expectations. So everything was pretty much um, planned towards someday going to college. But I had my days and my years too when I thought I don't need to go to college. I'm, you know, and my father was took up the, the cause my, uh, from there. And so um, uh, in our family, the way you measured success um, was how much education you had. So when my father would get together with his brothers, for family reunions or weddings or funerals. The discussion was, and how is your, how are your children? Which meant, did anybody get into medical school? Did anybody go into law school? Or is anybody a teacher or some? And it wasn't about the size of your house or the car you were driving or what you looked like. It was always, and how are the kids? So we always had to give my father bragging rights. He would say, okay, come on, give me something because we're going to get together with your tios and they're going to ask me how you're doing. So um, what they had not been able to have as a family in terms of education because of their situation of coming from Mexico and, um, and then not having resources during the Depression to go to college, they wanted to make sure their kids went. And so expectations were extremely high. There was no excuse, none, for anything but excellence in school. And it was never the teacher's fault. <laughs> it was always your fault, and you just didn't study hard enough. And so, um, so we just knew we had to do well. Can you tell me about some of your mentors um, through your college years? I. Um, you know, my husband was a mentor in many ways. 
he um, he did not he went to college a little bit but not ever graduated but uh, I was uh, at University of Houston I was um, 19 when I got married and I had I was going to finish my bachelor's degree there and my husband said you know this seems to be easy for you why don't we stay why don't you go on and get a, a graduate degree and I thought easy it's not easy and he said no 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 it, it really is it looks like it's easy for you just apply uh, so so really my husband who's six years older uh, was kind of more mature about things than I was I think so I applied and got in and uh, had a baby all of you know about the same time and uh, started graduate school and um, and he, so he played it and then got pregnant again and had another baby. So I was the pregnant Mexican at the U of H campus for a few years. Uh, I was doing classical rhetoric and public address. So I think um, he acted as a mentor. My father was always um, present and, a, and helpful. So if I needed tuition uh, money, dad would just send a check, uh, but keep going to school. You know? um, in, in college, the, the next most important mentor was my advisor in the doctoral program here at UT Austin, Martin Tadaro. He was a linguist. And I was in the College of Communication. I'd already, you know, uh, had a job at the college uh, back, in, back in Brownsville teaching by that time. I had left that to come to go to school here. And he just saw me as a serious student that wanted to make a difference. And faculty are always looking for those, right? And so when they find one, they kind of grab onto them. Well, he, he helped me. He loved opera, and, but he was um, um, not married. So his whole career was dedicated to helping students succeed. And so he, I said, I only have, I, you know, I have two babies. I'm in married student housing. I have to get back, and my husband has to get back to, to work. I have my father I want to get back to take care of. So I only have so many semesters. And he said, then you have to do this. And he mapped out every doctoral semester for me. He said, if you miss any one of these deadlines, you won't make it. And so we met them together. Um, and uh, he bought me a bottle of champagne <laughs> when I defended my dissertation. And, uh, and then when I eventually became president of the college in Brownsville, he came to my uh, installation, my investiture. So he was very important to me uh, while I was in school. So can you describe more of your college experience um, as far as maybe disparities that you saw um, going from your undergraduate to a university like the University of Texas at Austin um, for your PhD? Um, it, describe what kind of experiences, educational ones? Yes. Or, um, well, I, you know, I was like a nerd student. I mean, I, I was married, so I, you know, I wasn't into other things. Uh, I had the children. So it was either school or home. Um, I was in a very traditional um, programs. I was a debater, a college debater. I debated in the men's division for some silly reason. If you were in a mixed team, a, a, a boy and a girl, you had to debate in the men's division. So uh, I think that was very helpful to me. because I had grown up with boys, my two brothers and my father. And now I was doing debate against men. And so if you look back at my career, it was probably the best thing that I could have done to prepare me for the life that I was to lead. Um, and then I did classical rhetoric and public address. You know. And so I studied um, how to use um, your your voice, how to use your way of thinking, uh, how to use everything from syllogistic reasoning to persuade people, and and how to have impact with that uh, on on society and how to make change. Uh, so um, so that's what I did for the undergraduate and the graduate uh, 
degree from my master's. The PhD was very different. Here at, at the College of Communication, it was more linguistic in, in nature because that's what Martin Tadero was. So I uh, did a lot of my coursework in the linguistics department. But I was also um, did work, of course, in the, in the College of Communication. So I wasn't exactly sure what all of that was going to prepare me to do. I have to tell you very candidly. I, but I knew that the, the more I learned about how organizations work and how systems work um, and how you could use communications in those systems to, um, to make change, to do good, that the better prepared I would be. And so um, I studied language and systems and theory. Can you tell me how you decided to come to UT Austin for your PhD? Well, that was a hoot because I was a teacher. I was a, at Texas Southmost College. I was a, a faculty member there. And I found a bulletin board. This is, you're very young, but in the olden days before uh, internet and computers, we had bulletin boards. And on the bulletin board was a flyer from the Ford Foundation. And it was for students who wanted to do doctoral work. And I was still, I knew this was not what, I was not gonna teach for life, my lifetime. Was, I knew there was something more for me to do. I enjoyed it, I was very good at it. I loved my students, but I felt like I needed to do more. So the flyer was to apply for a fellowship to work on the doctorate. So I wrote down all the information, went home, told my husband, I, and he said, but we just got home. We just came back from Houston, now we're in Brownsville. You're with your father, da 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 da. And um, I said, I know, but I have this, I'm gonna, I'm gonna apply. And he said, you know, go ahead. So I did. And um, I, the short version is I got the fellowship. I um, interviewed in San Francisco at the San Francisco Airport Hilton. They flew us there for some reason. And, uh, and so I got a Ford Foundation Fellowship, which meant I had money to go to college, to work on the doctorate. So then it was, where can I go? Well, my husband had said we could not leave Texas. Why? I have no idea. And if I had been smarter, I would have said, oh, of course we could leave Texas, but no, you know, muy obediente. I said, okay, well then the only place I wanted to go was UT Houston. I mean, uh, University of Texas, Austin. So I applied and I got one of those very courteous letters back saying, uh, we have many qualified applicants. We'll get back to you. Well, that's not what I wanted to hear. So I did what you normally don't do. I looked at the letter. There was a name in the bottom of the letter. So I called up a professor that had written me the letter. Lear Ashmore was her name. I'll never forget it. So I called up Dr. Ashmore and I said, this is Julia Garcia and I've gotten this letter, but I need to get into this program. And she said, well, you know, we have many qualified applicants. We'll get back to you, hung up. And, and I thought, no, 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 you know, I need to get into the program. So about a week later, I called her back. Well, she gave me the same answer. The, the fifth time I called her, uh, she picked up the phone and I said, this is, and she goes, I know who this is. And, I, and not in a very nice way. So um, she said, just a minute, please. So she called up the department chair, whose name was Bob Jeffrey at the time. And she said, it's Garcia again. And, and Garcia is a very beautiful name, but she didn't say it beautifully. And I thought, well, I've just gone over the edge. She's not going to, this is not going to work out. And they had a little discussion over the phone. They didn't know I was on the line. She thought she had put me on hold while she had the conversation with him. But in fact, I was on line with them, not breathing, because I didn't want them to know I could hear their conversation. And he finally said, oh, let her in and press the button, he gets off the call, and now she and I are on the phone. And she said, well, Dr. Garcia, I mean, Julia Garcia, we've been studying your case, and we've decided to let you in. And I said, I, I thought to myself, I know, I heard, but I didn't say that. And I said, thank you, ma'am, very much. So I got in. I tell the story to students all the time, because sometimes we get turned down, and we walk away, and 
hang our head and think something was wrong with us. I knew I could do the work. It never dawned on me, and I don't know where that confidence came from, but it was like, let me in. I'll show you what I can do. Just let me in that door. And since my husband had said only in Texas, I and I had money, now it was just a matter of them letting me in. So I got in, and, and, and we should never stop trying. It may take five tries, but if you know that door is yours to, to walk into, you need to keep trying. So that's how I got here. We lived in married student housing. We had no money. Um, the whole time we were here, we would tell poor jokes. Uh, uh, poor jokes are, you think, I'm, you think you're poor. No, let me tell you what poor really is. So, you know, it was a, it was a good time because uh, it was married student housing with children. So it was high density kids. And at night, no one had money to do anything except sit around it and complain uh, about how poor they were. Uh, but those three years were just wonderful in retrospect. Uh, good years for us. Do you think that you would have stayed in Brownsville, Dr. Garcia, if there was a program there? I, you know, I always wanted to leave Brownsville. I think many of us grow up um, comfortable in our environment, no question, but anxious to see the world. And I wanted to leave the moment I got out of high school. I was ready. Uh, and so there was a, co a college there, community college, and I graduated from high school young since I had skipped, so I was 16. And so my father said, you can't leave at 16, uh, so you have to stay here for a year. Oh, I was furious. But, you know, and so I went to school there for a year. So, uh, but it never, if there had been a school there, I might have stayed, but I don't think so. I wanted a taste of other places, and I think that's very healthy. Uh, I knew we would always go back. I knew I had to be close to my father, and I had the responsibility there to take care of him. Um, so going back was one thing, but never having left was, was not uh, something I would have considered. Can you tell me about your pathway to becoming um, the president of a university? Well, um, let me just Would you like my... for us to stop the tape? Yes, please. Yes. One second. Okay. That'd be great. Thank you. I don't know if... Go okay. ahead. Well, you I'll can just... go ahead. Yeah. I, um, let's see, I was, so the short version, as short as I can get it, um, finished the doctorate, went back to Brownsville uh, to teach at the community college where I had been teaching. And the first year was very difficult for me because I thought, why did I go away and, and work so hard and study so much to come back and do the same job I was doing before I left. And I was very unhappy that first year, and I, I thought we had made a mistake going back home. And, um, and so, as it turned out, things were not going well on the college campus, and they were going to hire a new president. So I came home and told my husband, I'm going to apply for the presidency. And he looked at me like, what are you thinking? You've just come back. I was about 28 at the time. I didn't know anything about administration or, uh, I said, I'm not sure why I have to do this, Oscar, but I, I have to raise my hand. I have to show them that I'm interested in doing more than this. And um, so I applied. Well, of course, I'm sure people laughed and thought it was kind of silly that I had done so. But for some reason, I ended up in the finalist group. I'm sure it's because I was the only woman to apply and they figured we better get one woman in the pool, you know, it'll look better. But here all of a sudden I was being interviewed for the presidency of Texas Southmost College, the school I had just been to as a freshman a few years earlier. So um, I went through an interview, a terrible interview with, those, with guys, they were all men uh, that were members of the board. 
and they asked me things like, how old are you? which is, of course, against the law, but they didn't know that. And so one of the other board members who did know that said, if you can add and subtract, you've got our birth date right in front of you. Next question, please. Another one asked me, said, okay, you have to go on a trip uh, with, uh, with a, a male colleague. Do you both go on the same plane? And once you get there, do you stay in the same hotel? And I thought, are you kidding? I have gone, <laughs> I have sweat, blood, and tears to get this degree, and now you're going to be asking me about. And but I, but I was polite, and I said, I'm a member of many uh, organizations, most of which are male dominated. I've never had a problem, nor do I expect to now. Next question. So it was a terrible interview, and I remember going back to my little office with a, another office. Um, colleague of mine and and I'm sure I was angry uh, but it was so disgusting to be treated in such a pejorative way I and for the first time I realized what it was like for a woman who is treated badly or or is abused in some way because I felt abused and it was just the interview but it was so uh, it was it was a wrong way to treat people and so, uh, so the president that did get the job had me to deal with then. All he thought of this, I've got this troublemaker here and I better put her, get her busy. So he offered me a position at, as the director of the self-study for reaffirmation of accreditation with Southern Association of Colleges and Schools, which meant the college had to get reaccredited every 10 years. He was offering me the job of, of working on that reaffirmation of accreditation. I had no clue what that was. I took it, and I thought I can learn whatever it is. Well, it was like throwing me in another graduate program because I learned so much about things I had no clue about and about our own college, but I also learned about the standards for reaffirmation of accreditation. So at the end of the three years, I knew more about accreditation and the standards and how we met or did not meet those standards than even the president. I could tell you how many trucks we owned. Um, I could tell you how many employees we had, how many books in the library there were by subject matter, how many faculty we had, what their credentials were, you know. So I became a student of our school. And um, so as soon as I finished that job, the a dean's position of arts and sciences opened up. And I had been working with a vice president that now was going to choose the dean. And I, I think he saw a workhorse. And I was the workhorse. And I was willing to do whatever. And so I got named. It was very difficult because I was I hadn't paid my dues in the traditional sense. I had not been a department chair. I hadn't been there for, I had no white hair then. I was still very young. And so I was the boss as dean of the department chairs that didn't want me to be their dean. And that was, that was a challenge. And so I learned a great deal about how to build a team from people that really didn't want you there in the first place. Um, I served as a dean for five years and now learned about a great deal about how colleges work from that vantage point and how colleges don't work well. Because you know you learn as much from people that are very smart as people that are not so smart. So you, you learn from both sides. At any rate, um, president of the college leaves after seven years, the, the same one that had gotten the job earlier, and now the presidency is open again, and um, I apply again. I got it the second time. But I got it because I believe, I was prepared, but also because there were two women on the board of trustees at the time. And I'm convinced that had, had it not been for those two women persuading their male colleagues to give me a chance that I never would have uh, been given that chance. So I've been helped by women a great deal along the way. So what did you, being named um, the president of Texas Southmost College, um, you were the first female Mexican-American president of a college or a university in 1986. 
Um, what did that reveal about the higher education system? <laughs> well, still, there are still very few women in, in administration, especially in the higher echelons. There are still very few Hispanic, Latina women. Um, and so in 1986, it was completely unheard of. There were about 11 Latina women in the United States that were in um, higher ed positions of stature. And we ended up meeting somewhere some, some day in Washington, D.C. for some meeting. And we decided never to travel together because if something happened to us, we'd wipe out the whole, <laughs> the whole group of Latinas that were in these positions. Um, so it was, um, uh, we realized, we, you know, we, we, individually, we weren't doing this to break new ground for the Latina woman. I think individually, we all just kind of found ourselves trying to do good for our institution and, um, and then became colleagues along the way. But, but it, well, I'll give you an example. When I became president of the community college in Texas, there were 55, I think, community colleges at that time, junior community colleges in Texas. I was the woman. Shortly after that, there was one other woman that came on. Um, so the guys didn't know how to handle having a female colleague. Right? It's Texas. So I get a call the summer after I was named, but from one of the presidents. And uh, he said, um, Dr. Garcia, he had no, no, no one had met me yet. So they had heard that some Mexicana got named in Brownsville, but they had not met me. So he, he was kind of chosen to give me a call, and he said, he's kind of stuttering. And he said, um, uh, uh, are you coming to the summer meeting of the community college presidents? And I said, I'm not sure yet. And he said, um, uh, uh, is uh, your husband coming? And I thought, well, how strange a question. And I, so I was kind of doing multitasking, right? So I put down all my papers and I'm on the phone and I think, and I said, why are you asking me if my husband is coming? And he said, well, stutter, stutter. Um, the, we usually play golf the day before the meeting, and we wanted to extend an invitation to your husband to play with us. And I thought, <laughs> and I, I'm just, it was, it was hilarious. It was, and I, I said, well, uh, thank you, and I'll extend the invitation to him, but um, I doubt that he'll be coming with me. So I decided not to go to that summer meeting after all. When I did show up in the fall, I guess, when they convened again, uh, I was not welcomed in the way that you would like to be welcomed. No one was ever rude, but they were not welcoming. So I was trying to save money all the time for the college, so I would not rent a car. I would go in a cab. Then they would all get together and go somewhere in cabs or somebody would have a car to go together. I got left in the parking lot three times until I learned I better rent my own car because I was going to be eating alone for a while. So I learned not to be a, a, a member of the group. Uh, so eventually, we started the University of Texas at Brownsville in partnership with Texas Southwest College. And these same guys were very upset at me because I was ruining the model of what they considered to be a community college and uh, testified against me at the uh, state of Texas uh, in the uh, legislative session. And one of them called me up ahead of time to tell me they were going to testify against me. And, and I said, well, you do what you have to do. And he said, um, well, you left the fold. And I said, sir, you had to be part of the fold in order to leave it. I was never part of the fold. So, um, so you just kind of have to learn to work sometimes solo in order to move your agenda forward. What did you like the most about being an administrator? You could get things to happen. I, when I, I remember walking into the library, and we had this horrible library. You know, it's the little things. And she was just ornery. She just was the most unwelcoming librarian. And so she had put up these horrible signs. And I hated them when I was a faculty member because they had a big, I can tell you exactly what it looked like. So it's a big poster, and it had the word no, N-O. And then it was no talking no chewing gum, no writing in the books, no, you know, obvious stuff. 
but 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 you were hit with a very strong negative and all of a sudden now I'm president and I walked into the library and I saw the poster and I kind of looked around right and I pulled it down and I thought never again are you going to put up these nasty signs in our in our college so it was little things sometimes uh, it was um, it was learning how to treat people and, and live with them and work with them professionally and the way you wanted to be treated. Uh, it was getting things done. It was becoming an advocate. Well, I guess the, 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 the tie to the College of Communication is interesting here because when you teach persuasion, debate, rhetoric, articulation, you're teaching the theory. But inside me, I always wondered, could I do it, right? Could I convince people to walk off the edge of the cliff if I needed them to? Could I convince them to become better than they are? And, and, and I wanted to know if I, was, if I was an imposter, if I was just the, the theory, or if I could actually do it. And this was my test. So, so to me, every time I speak, even to this day, uh, it is using everything I learned in all the courses I took in communication. But it's, can I do some good with it? Can I build a bigger school? Can I bust puff and get us the money we need in the Valley? You know, can I open um, d degree programs in physics where they think the Valley doesn't need programs in physics? You know, can I start programs in chess because our kids are so brilliant uh, uh, because they're bilingual and they're smarter than a monolingual child. So I had so every, every innovation that we've tried over the years um, has been kind of a test of advocacy. And so that's what I have learned to become. So if you had to ask, you know, what one word defines your work the most? Um, when are you happiest? When are you fulfilled? It's when I'm an advocate. When I'm unhappiest is the opposite. When someone's sitting on me or constraining my ability to be in the game or to not participate, that's hard. And there are times when you have to be silent. When some legislator is more powerful than you are and, and, you, and you have to wait to make the case in a different way. You have to go back and prepare a stronger case and not say anything. Because you know, sometimes you can just talking is gonna not be not gonna be the right thing to do. So so I think that's where the two connect. Can you describe also um, the element of your university being an administrator, being so close to the US Mexico border? Well, you know, there are, I get offered jobs um, because I'm still one of the very few uh, Latinas in higher education administration uh, because I speak in a way that is acceptable to dominant society because I've uh, succeeded in this work because I'm squeaky clean, I get good audits. You know, so I get, I get job offers or invitations to, to apply and have for many years. But, but very few actually attract me, right? Because just to be a, at a bigger school, it's not really what I intended to do. Or just to get a bigger paycheck or just to live in a, another place. You know, it's not why I did this work. So, um, so I think, you know, I think that, I think the important part he, here is um, on the border, I felt like I, I could do this work. I was chosen, and this is a little, you know, a little corny, but but sometimes you just kind of feel like, oh, okay, that's why the stars aligned. That's why mother did what she did. That's why dad saved money for us to go to college. That's why I was able to come back and do this work. I was needed here. Anybody can do 
fill in the blank college, but only a few of us really know what it's like to grow up on the border and live on the border and honor it, respect it, and want to and reinforce it, enhance it. So I think I was kind of, you know, well positioned to do this work at this moment in this place. And, and it is a challenge. There's just no question. I mean, it is complicated, and, but it's also enriched and, and, um, and exciting. Um, so um, I guess being on the outside as a woman or as a Hispanic or as UT Brownsville for so many years not getting uh, PAW funds was kind of just like what my job was meant to be. Um, but I think I was able to bring bring us all the way finally into the big boys table, into get to accessing the permanent university fund dollars and uh, being an equal partner in the UT system um, when others might not have been able to do that. So now I'd like to talk about the lawsuit um, where Maldef brought that lawsuit for LULAC against um, state officials for discriminating against universities on the border. You had been the president of Texas Southmost College for five years at the point that this lawsuit um, mm -hmm. began. So can you tell me what the significance of a case like this was to be going on while you were in that position of a president? It was huge. It was, if you had asked me at the time, I'm not sure if I could have ex understood it as well as I can now. But um, so we were swimming upstream, right? We had no money. We were trying to um, uh, open the doors to more students. Uh, but we only had local and very uh, uh, scarce resources, revenue streams, dollars to put to that work. And then people were saying, why can't your students do as well? And I'm saying, you know, give me the money that you're spending on a student at UT Austin. And you watch, I can get my student to do that well. But, but don't give me 10 cents and you give them $10 and then ask, why aren't your students doing as well? So, I mean, it was, it was, it was a hard time. So MALDEF comes in and sees this big picture. And Al Kaufman and Norma Cantu, lead attorneys in the MALDEF case. And Norma was from Brownsville, or is from Brownsville. Norma had grown up there, had gone, um, had started teaching school there, but wanted to do more, had gone on to Harvard Law School. And uh, I mean, just smart as a tap. If you don't know Norma, you need to know Norma Cantu. She's just wonderful. At any rate, so now it was Norma Cantu and Al Kaufman leading the charge. And uh, so we were a little player in this bigger um, game. Uh, but we had Ann Richards as our governor. That was really important. Bob Bullock was our lieutenant governor. But Ann Richards was a governor for the people. She appointed during her time as governor more women and more non-traditional women, Hispanic, blacks, LGBT women of all kinds to committees and, and positions of power in, uh, in Austin, the state government. So, so MALDEF, I think, decided it was a good time to take on the state of Texas. But they had to sue someone, they had to sue the governor. So now they're suing our wonderful governor, Ann Richards, and the attorney general, uh, and, I mean the lieutenant governor, and they're suing um, I believe in their lawsuit, all of the regents, well, nobody likes to get sued, much less regents. Um, so the story is that um, Bob Bullock called in a couple of these chancellors, A&M and, and uh, UT, and said, you better get some stuff going on on the border because we're going to get sued here and we're likely to lose and I don't want to lose in this lawsuit. Uh, and so they decided to start to look toward the border. So that's when you saw UT take on Pan American in Edinburgh, when A&M took on Laredo, uh, and they established Laredo, um, uh, the, the university there at Laredo, uh, and 
Brownsville was just kind of a little appendage there to Pan American. Um, we were not even in existence as UT Brownsville when the lawsuit was filed. So if you look at the the tales of the lawsuit, UT Brownsville, I don't believe, is listed at all because we didn't exist. It wasn't until after the lawsuit got settled that we existed. And so then I stood in line because we now we now were going to get the benefit of the Maldef lawsuit. So the Maldef lawsuit uh, made the case that we had tried to make individually, but they made it now for everybody. And it was so powerful. And it said that it was wrong. That the, that the number of people that were in the, in the border area that needed higher education far outweighed the resources and that there was great inequity across the state with regards to distribution of those resources and that it needed to be fixed. So we all had a part in testifying and in helping MALDEF build their case. But the real lead and the real important people in this were, were MALDEF. When they won the lawsuit, and before it was appealed at the Supreme Court, it was during that interim that the state said, you better get down there and do something with those Mexicanos. And so that's when all this money started to come down. So the South Texas Border Initiative that lasted for about 10 years was as a result, a direct result of the winning of the lawsuit at the district court level. Unfortunately, it was reversed at the Supreme, at the Texas Supreme Court level, and that spigot of money soon turned off. But but we were there when it was opened for a few years, and benefited greatly. So, can you elaborate a little bit more about your role during this case as the president? It was my first uh, time to play a larger role in advocacy. And so it was to gather up data and to present it and to testify whenever I was asked to testify. I um, testified before the Perot Commission one time. Uh, Norma Canthu testified right before me and Norma is ten times tougher than I am in, in, when, you're, when she's you know, out and around. And, and I would call her the junkyard dog because she would go for the jugular, you know. And I'm kind of more polite and whatever. So, so Norma went ahead of me in, in making, uh, in presenting testimony. And they didn't like her at all because she was just tough on them. And then I walked up and made my case and the Ross Perot came chasing me out of the hearing room afterwards and he says, now you're the voice of reason. So I went out and grabbed Norma and I said, you always have to go ahead of me. You're the bad cop, I'll be the good cop. And we'll, <laughs> as a team, we're good. So, so um, everybody has their own style. And, and Norma is, was very helpful uh, and, and absolutely necessary from Malda's point of view. And so I came in with the, the more voice of, not, not that she didn't have a voice of reason, it was just that I, I wasn't going for the, for the jugular like she was. But I learned from her. I learned sometimes you do have to, you have to do that in order to be heard. What kinds of information were you gathering um, to make your case? A uh, number of degree programs that were available to students south of, of San Antonio, for example. There was a, a clear line of demarcation for the MALDEF lawsuit. And in essence, they said anything south of San Antonio counts as South Texas, and then west all the way to El Paso. So we were the southern part of that, of that uh, line of demarcation. Uh, so it was number of students, population that was growing. So we were a younger population, more in need of higher education, but with less resources. So it was number of dollars coming to our community, number of degree programs that were available at all levels, bachelor's, master's, PhD programs. And we had literally no PhD programs at all. Maybe we had one or two ED programs at Doctorate of Education, but, but very, and, they, and we were never to get them. I mean, I remember talking one time in, in the UT world uh, about a, a PhD in, in, um, in physics is what we were talking about. And they looked at me like, you were never meant to do that. I mean, were you really thinking that you all were going to play in the big kids game? And I remember driving home that thing, you know, thinking, how am I going to change 
this mentality because it was, we're going to let you in, but only to be this kind of institution. Don't get your aspirations so high. And so it was said, and it was not said, but it was all inferred clearly that we were allowed to become part of it, but not to not to um, get too chiflados, you know, don't think you're going to get what others have gotten. So it was availability of degree programs. It was money for construction, money for libraries, money for faculty, and, and programming in general. How did this lawsuit affect the morale at your university? Well, finally we had, I think, a, a united voice. Um, loud voice, strong voice, well-documented voice, um, advocating for our needs. And we all felt a part of it. And, and it, was, it was helpful to have everybody in it together because each one of us individually, we're not going to be able to make the difference. Even all of us together, we're not going to be able to make the difference we wanted. But at least we had a chance, and we learned from each other in the process. Um, and so it was very, it was very powerful, life-giving. Do you remember what people said about the lawsuit when it was going on? You know, when you're in it, you're not a student of it yet uh, in a wiser way. So um, I just remember wanting to go to every meeting I could find because it was it was a place to participate in something that was important and it was a chance for advocacy and a chance to to make things better. So um, no one likes troublemakers, right? And they saw us as troublemakers. And I had been part of Valley Interfaith and I don't know if you know it, Valley Interfaith was a community organizing group that had come out of the um, Industrial Areas Foundation. So it was uh, COPS in San Antonio. It was um, Episo in, in El Paso. It was Valley Interfaith in the Rio Grande Valley. Um, it was something else in LA. But it was an attempt to organize the Hispanic community through community-based organizations and churches. So it was interfaith, so that you could have Protestants and Evangelicals and Catholics. And the job was to speak out for the rights of the poor. So I had, I had been a leader in Valley Interfaith and had been involved in that. And um, so that had been my, my kind of on the street experience. Into it. But now I could do it from a position as president of a college. And my father had always said, because when I was in Valley Interfaith, we were accused of being Marxist. Uh, on television, we were doing something one day, and I came home, and Dad said, Honey, you were on television. I said, Really? And that was like not going to be a compliment for him. And uh, he said, They called you a, a Marxist. And I said, Uh huh. And he said, Are you? And I said, No. And he goes, I didn't think so. <laughs> so, uh, so, you know, when, when you're, when you are trying to, raise the flag for inequity. Sometimes people don't like it. A lot of times people don't like it. Um, that's happened there, it's happened to me in the UT system where uh, when we bef before we were available, uh, we were able to get Puff money. I would raise my hand and I would say, once again, there's a distribution without UT Brownsville and UT Pan American at the table, this is wrong. And depending on who was a chancellor at the time, they'd kind of roll their eyes and. Like, can't somebody just keep her quiet? Well, you know, that's why we were meant to do what we're doing. So um, people help you when you are in those positions. Uh, some people do. Uh, uh, you can't wait for them to help you. You know, you, you find strength in just one or two people, not in a mass number. Can you tell me a little bit more about what kinds of disparities you saw at um, your particular school while you were the president and while this lawsuit was going on? Um, well, the, the biggest was the resources, uh, just the lack of funds and the lack of programs. You see, in Texas, you have to get permission to add a degree. 
You couldn't just say, I think I'll start a pharmacy school. You had to go and ask permission of the Texas Higher Education Coordinating Board. And first you had to ask permission of the UT system. And before you could do any of those things, you had to prove that you had the money to be able to build, let's say, a pharmacy school. Which meant, do you have money to hire the faculty, to build a building, to, to, to establish the labs, to, to have the internships? If you didn't have access to funds, you couldn't start down that path. So, so there, were two, there were hurdles every step of the way to building programs. So they would say, well, go to the pharmacy school in Austin. Well, how many kids from El Paso or from Brownsville could afford to leave their home and go to, to Austin? So it was always a matter of resources because to start a new program, you need permissions. To get permissions, you need money. If you didn't have money, you couldn't even ask for the permission because it was going to be denied. So money's always been at the center of, of, the, of the fight. So one thing that lawyers for the state said was that the border wasn't ready for more doctoral programs and that students weren't prepared for these kinds of programs to have them at their schools. So what did you think about that? Well, okay, so, so how can you be prepared to run a marathon? If you're the descalzo, if you're if you're without shoes, how can you train? How can you succeed at the race, right? And so what I would tell them is, you know, put my students up against anyone who comes to UT Austin, but let me have the same tennis shoes on on my student as you put on the one at UT Austin. Let me have the same gymnasium that they have to work out with, the same trainers, the same, and, and then then let's run that race. And then let's see who's better, you know, who can compete. So it's not a matter of innate ability. It's a matter of opportunity. And so if, if my second grade school teacher had not cared and I had been sent back to first grade or whatever, I might have gone down a whole different path. She decided instead to enhance my education, take me to the opera, open doors, open, I mean, to change the, 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 um, the rules of how things work. So to say that our students weren't ready for doctoral training was was an argument of no. You, I mean, it was it was insane because you can't be ready for the race if you're barefoot. You're not going to win that race. But let me prepare them to do physics, or let me. Okay, so the chess story. You you you, you may not know that in the valley we play chess, right? And our kids starting out in, at five years old, start learning how to play chess. And they, they play so well that they beat all the kids in the state of Texas. So they won the Texas State Championship. And Texas is a big state, and there's lots of little charter schools and private schools all learning chess. Our kids beat everybody in Texas, went to Washington, D.C., came in second in the nation. And these little kids didn't have the blazers and the outfits. They had little t-shirts that one of the local vendors had leftovers and gave it to them. The point of them doing well for us, they were five, six, seven year olds, was that they were as smart as anybody else. First of all, they hadn't been told that they couldn't do it, right? They were still innocentes. They thought they could do it and they did. Uh, and so today even, to this day, there are thousands of kids playing and competing in chess in the Rio Grande Valley. And the, and the university's team uh, every year goes to the final four of chess competition. So our chess team at UT Brownsville beat Stanford one year, beat Duke one year, beat Princeton at Princeton one year. So what, you know, so it's just a matter of opportunity not innate ability. So the Maldives suit was about opportunity. It was give them the programs and they'll do well, but never give it to them because they're not ready. <laughs> so it was vital. It, it changed everything for us. 
So what did something like the South Texas Border Initiative that resulted from the case lead to what you started working toward at your specific university? The, the South Texas Border Initiative um, gave us real money. It gave us real money for about 10 years. It said, here's the programs you can add. Here's the money to build buildings, money to hire faculty, money to build the libraries that you need to support those programs or equipment, um, build these programs. So uh, South Texas Border Initiative was, uh, in my opinion, uh, Ann Richards' way and others' way of funneling dollars to South Texas. When it got started, uh, at first people were like, okay about it. But every legislative session, um, we would get funneled more money through the South Texas Border Initiative. And the other colleges and universities didn't like it at all. And so it started to smell after a while, right? Because the other colleges and universities were, were jealous of us getting this extra money. Well, we had not been getting it for a hundred years. We were just trying to catch up. They said, well, we, we're done with you. We've already gotten yours. Well, no. You know, we, were, we had just been at the trough for five years, six years. They'd been at the trough for a hundred years or 50 years. So eventually that money dried up. It dried up because the political winds changed again. But those te about 10 years of that South Texas Border Initiative um, created a new mass of programs, uh, faculty, and libraries and buildings in South Texas uh, universities. So I'm going to kind of fast forward a little bit to um, 2008, where they were discussing building this wall that would essentially cut through the university that you were administrating. Can you talk about that? We received a letter from the Department of Homeland Security, and the letter was requesting permission, uh, was asking for me to sign permission to allow them to come on our campus to begin to survey and prepare the land and the space uh, in order to erect um, a border wall. And uh, I, I, just, I couldn't sign the letter. I decided I could not give permission for anyone to do such a horrendous thing on our campus. Um, it was um, against everything I had spent my whole career trying to build. Um, our mission as a university was one that honored both languages, both cultures, uh, reached toward international programs, and now I was to support building a wall between the other half of who we were supposed to be building this, this international mission with. Um, Además, I was also to um, not um, hold them responsible for any wrongdoing during the building of the wall. So if they came onto the campus and had to remove trees or had to um, damage the campus in any way or any of our students in the process, uh, I was to look the other way. I mean, they wanted to take 120 acres of our property that was adjacent to the river and build a fence between us and those 120 acres. And they wanted us to have gates between us and that 120 acres. So a student would have to show some what, ID to get to the golf course, to play golf. I mean, it was insane. Um, they um, uh, wanted to build an 18 foot high picket fence um, because they said that there was some terrible things happening. Um, we uh, that grew up on the border knew that there was very little evidence that any of these horrendous things were happening on our campus. We have crime statistics as UT Brownsville, like every other campus uh, in the UT system, and I had to know how many burglaries there were on our campus or attempts of assault or whatever it was. 
And our crime statistics, even though we were on the border, were better than many of the campuses in the UT system that were in faraway places far from the border. None of that seemed to matter to the Department of Homeland Security. Because I thought, well, they just don't know. We're a safe campus. I'm going to show them my crime statistics, and then they'll go away. Well, that didn't work. Um, none of the things that we tried in terms of reasoned argument worked. Um, so I finally uh, refused to sign. I had to get our chancellor at the time, Mark Udoff, to um, help me defend this position in court. We were in federal court. Um, because when I refused, it was in December, I think, that, that I was supposed to return the letter. By January or February, I had not returned it, signed, so they filed a lawsuit. And they sued all of us. Um, uh, and uh, so we were in federal court for a year uh, fighting our own country. That's what it felt like. It was a strange time because um, I mean, here I am. Uh, if you would ask me what's the most important part of your job, I would tell you um, developing the next generation of leaders to sustain the democracy of the United States, right? Because a democracy requires an educated population. So my job is to take the next wave of immigrants or the next wave of native Texans and, and make them productive citizens. And all of us in our democracy, and all of a sudden this, this wonderful democracy was suing us to build this. I mean, it didn't make any sense to me at all. It was a very difficult year for all of us. So now the universities that you were the president for, it was Texas Southmost, Southmost College, and then it merged with UT Brownsville. Now it's UT Rio Grande Valley. Can you talk about if is it, would it be fair to compare a university like UT Rio Grande Valley with a university like the University of Texas at Austin and say that, okay, will UT Rio Grande Valley ever be on the level of a university like UT? You know, um, uh, there are many ways of looking at a, uh, what, a, what a successful university will look like. My intent as president um, of UT Brownsville was never to try and be like UT Austin. I had gone to UT Austin. I, I admired it very much. I was very proud of my degree from UT Austin. But UT Austin's what it is. It's got its own character and its own culture, its history, it's rich. Um, no one probably will ever succeed at becoming another UT Austin, nor should it, nor should it. That was, for me, the key. So if you, if you can't replicate, or nor do you want to replicate, what should you be? So my job was to develop a university that was unique and that was for its place and its moment in time. So when I was, um, when I was president of UT Brownsville, the idea was, what's our strength? What do we bring to the table here? So when I was at Austin, if I said the word resaca, people didn't know what it meant. Everyone in Brownsville knows that resaca is like little oxbow lakes that are all over the city, right? And so, so it, it made us smarter. I know two words for that lake, right? Not one. Too. And so to me, I didn't want to diminish what we were. I wanted to have it count. And, and that was valuing the notion of being bilingual, biliterate, being able to read and write in two languages, and, and bicultural, and being able to do that business in two languages. So if you're a nurse or a doctor and you're providing a service to a patient, and the patient can only speak Spanish, and I can speak Spanish, but if I have a monolingual English-speaking uh, English patient, I can do that too. Then who would you hire? You're bo we're both physicians, but I'm bilingual, the other one's not. You might want to hire the added value one, the one that has two languages, given also the demographic shifts in our country. So I often thought, I never aspired to be UT Austin. I aspired to to take the strengths of the people that come to us as our market, 
They're bilingual. They're not always biliterate because we're not taught in two languages. We're not always completely bilingual in the sense of professional um, registers of speech. But if I could help you hone your skills in both English and Spanish, and then I could help you do that work or negotiate a business deal in Chicago or in Mexico City, who has, and both, in both cases, be the English major or the engineer or the physician, who's got the more valuable graduate? In a world economy, in a global environment, you might say it was the, that student who had facility in two languages, two cultures, or three or four. We had a student on campus one year who was from Cuba. His mother was Russian, so he knew Russian from his mother. His father was Cubano, so he knew Spanish. He learned English in school. He came to us trilingual. He learned Mandarin Chinese on our campus. He had four languages, and he was a good-looking young man. So, I mean, this guy could do anything. So why would we want to diminish a, 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 um, ourselves uh, and not value what we bring to the table in terms of of our culture and our language. So my notion was not ever to emulate UT Austin. So the, the whole question to me was irrelevant. It was, okay, now can we do physics? It, does math need a language? No, mathematicians just need math. Do musicians need a language? No, they just want people who can play music. So we, we leaned in to those fields of physics, music, chess, those areas where language is important, but it's not the, the, the ticket to get in. So our mathematicians came from all over the world, our physicists from all over the world, our chess player, players from all over the world. And so they spoke a smarter language, one that, that allowed them to become, uh, I think, more capable in a global environment. Could you tell me, Dr. Juliet Garcia, what you would like to see happen in the future with South Texas Border Universities? Uh, <laughs> yeah, that's a whole other interview, but um, I'd like them to lean in to their strengths. I'd like them to be known for their special qualities. So I don't care if we don't play football blasphemous. But I'd like us to, to be the best in soccer, right? I mean, that's, that's part of who we are as we grow up. Uh, so why wouldn't we lean into that? Uh, but I always am surprised, okay, because I, once I say that, then I end up something with that I uh, had a faculty member who said that he wanted to start a jazz group. And I said, jazz in South Texas? Are you kidding? Well, we ended up with the best jazz band uh, in, in, of many in the United States, and we we're invited to Notre Dame several times to play in the jazz competition at Notre Dame. So I can't, I, I have to be careful because the moment I say we we shouldn't do that, you know, one of our guys does it. But but we we uh, my aspirations are that someday people will want to go to the universities on the border because they're more ecumenical. They're more global in their worldview. And if you want to live and work in a global environment, you want to get prepared for that there. And so you would choose to go there to internship, to live in, in the cross-border environment that's so rich. You would choose to, cho to, to make that your home campus because it excelled in energy problems, how to solve energy problems that are cross-border, that are of the Americas, right? That are water issues, women's health issues, disease issues. Zika knows no border. Um, women's issues, health issues know no border. So, so I would hope that, that someday people say, boy, if you really want to major in fill in the blank, um, and you want to learn how to deal with global issues. You know, one of the things to remember is that the global part, the global south is much more like the issues of the global south, like if you're in Peru or if you're in Brazil or if you're in South Africa or India. Those issues of the global south are the same issues of Texas border 
we're more like the global south than we are the global north. We compare against Massachusetts. Why would we do that? That doesn't make any sense. But compare us against issues in the global south, and now all of a sudden we're in a, you know, we're in a territory that's more familiar. So we need to, to our compass needs to, we, we are at the epicenter. We need to be proud of that. We need to own our geography, not just look north. We have a much more important place to be than just looking north. We look across the Americas, and we're the epicenter of a very important place where the Americas, English-speaking Americas, um, bump into Spanish-speaking Americas. That's where innovation can occur. So I know that you're writing a book about the creation of UT Rio Grande Valley. So what was the significance, first of all, can you, um, about this merging of UT Brownsville with um, UT Pan American? Well, we, uh, we have, the most significant thing about it was the opportunity to break open um, eligibility to the Permanent University Fund. UT Brownsville, UT Pan American had for decades um, since they were established never able to receive permanent university funds. That was a terrible thing because while UT San Antonio, UT El Paso, UT Austin, everybody was getting millions and millions of dollars for new buildings, new programs, we were not. And that hurt. And of course it set us back. And people wonder, why are y'all don't have these buildings? And we say, well, it's not a matter of not wanting them. We were not eligible. So, so what the creation of UTRGV did was to make us PUF eligible. The only way to do that was to uh, create a new university. Well, the only way to do that was to abolish the two current universities. So you had to kind of go all the way down. So, so did you want to get into Puff? Yes. Well, to do that, were you willing to abolish the current structure to create a new structure? Yes. There was no question. I mean, the moment it was proposed to me by Francisco Cigarro, our chancellor, he said, Julieta, you've been harassing for years about not being Puff eligible. And I said, yes. And he said, that's all, all going to be over if you agree to do this. And I said, well, what do you mean? And he said, well, here's the plan. If we can create a new university and make it PUF eligible and, uh, and abolish, the word abolish was hard. I, I couldn't even say it for the first few months, right? Abolish the school that we built? Are you kidding? Abolish Pan America and its rich history? But if you're willing to do that, then we'll have a new university have a new name, you know, all of that. Most importantly, it'll be Puff eligible. And I said, well, absolutely, and um, helped make that happen. So can you tell me maybe something, some, some more inside information about your book? When is that going to come out? As soon as I finish writing it. <laughs> uh, I'm working with Angela McCauley uh, on the book, and we are interviewing um, people who were uh, involved intimately in that um, story. So interviewing members of the UT system at the time, like Francisco Cigaroa and Pedro Reyes, former Board of Regent Chair, Jean Powell, um, and um, the, uh, the wonks, the policy wonks, like Steve Collins, um, who helped devise the plan of abolishing and creating. Um, legislators that had to pass the laws, uh, mayors that had to agree to abolish and build, and and um, and uh, community leaders who had to weigh in on it. So um, I've learned a great deal about people's thinking, and um, we should be done um, by uh, August of this year. That's the deadline. What would you say to Texas living in the South Texas border region right now who are benefiting from your work essentially since you became the president in 1986 of Texas South Moscow College? 
what would I say to them? Take advantage, run fast, you know, use it up. Use every opportunity you can to, uh, don't look back, you know. I mean, to learn from what we've done, yes, but there's so much still to do. I think that's the hardest part, you know, is, is, is thinking, are you done yet? Are you done? You know, did you get to be, no, we're not done. Is UT done? Is UT Austin done? No. So why would we be done? You know, that, that's the hard part is for when someone says, ya mero, ya mero, ya mero, mijita. No, no, que ya mero, mijita. We're just getting going. So we got it started. We opened the door. But there's a lot of work to be done. And, and it's going to take a next generation of advocates and leaders and, and brave people <laughs> to work together. Not because you have the answers. No one ever knows how things, you know, should be exactly, but to give it a try and to keep working at it and to build coalitions um, that strengthen each other to make that happen. So much yet to be done. So I'd like to retract just a little bit um, on your elementary years when you said that you were reprimanded because you were, you spoke Spanish, you were in a different class. Can you talk a little bit about that? What was that like for you? Um, we knew that um, uh, we would be punished if we spoke Spanish in school. That was just a rule. I don't know if it was official or not, but we knew. Uh, and so our parents had said, keep your Spanish f for home and church and being with your family. And, um, and then, but in English, in school, learn English and speak English. And um, so you know, the message, in, in my home, because our parents were very proud of both languages and they were both bilingual, I, I wasn't not proud of Spanish. I just knew that in school, that's what I was supposed to speak, it was English. Um, my father was a Mexican citizen, a, um, carried a green card, so was a naturalized, um, uh, citizen of the United States. Uh, uh, my mother was born here, but but um, but we were they were proud of both countries and both both worlds. So one never was diminished uh, for us uh, over the other. But it was clear uh, growing up in our town that there were places where English only was appropriate. And um, and we should not violate that uh, that rule. Now going back to your husband, can you tell me how you two met? He was a friend of my older brother. You know how that works. So I was the little sister running around, and and I think he was just desperate one time <laughs> and needed a date, and so I got invited. He our first date is very terrible confession. Uh, was to the movies, and he took me to the theater. And Tonta over here, thinking I was doing a good thing, I pulled out my my student discount card, so he could pay less, right? And he saw my age. He thought I was older than I actually was, so he gave me back my little discount card, put me in the car, and took me home. And I didn't see him for about four years, I think. <laughs> so he waited until I got a little bit older, and then he came back. So that's how I met my husband. He was a friend of my older brother. Thank you for that. You're welcome. So how did you um, navigate the challenge of being the dean of faculty members who didn't want you in that position? I thought if I just get smarter, my mother always said, Mijita, you just have to be smarter, you know, in, in both languages. And I thought, I'm going to be smarter than these guys. Most of them were, were men. And I'm going to know more about what they do than they know. And then that way, I'll have, a, I'll have a, an advantage. So I started to study, not like, like you do in school, you study. But as a dean, I studied what they were offering, the credentials of their faculty, how many students they had, how efficient they were with the use of their money, what classrooms they were using, and how I could redo things. And when I would bring up a new idea about how we were going to schedule classes, or it sounds so mundane now, but important things, how we were going to recruit new faculty, they would start to say, well, we can't do that. And I, and I knew better. I knew their numbers. I knew, the, I knew everybody's numbers, because they just knew each of their own. 
And so I just over-prepared and learned more. Remember, I had done the self-study. So I knew the, the college's numbers. Now I, I knew their individual numbers. And um, I made them become better department chairs. Now, I didn't do it all by myself. I had, I had a few people all along the way who would help me and teach me. There was one lady who was a chairwoman of the biology department. And I had known her since I was a little girl. I mean, she was my elder. And she taught me how to be a dean because she was so good at being a department chair. And she came in and told me, I'm going to need this many microscopes. And this is the rotation for how I handle my microscope lenses and my beakers and whatever. And this is how I do it. And she, I mean, she was so organized. I thought, well, everybody should do it like Barbara does. So I took her model and and made everybody do it like she was doing it. So you learn from people along the way. In many cases, I learned from smart women. Can you tell me how it feels to look back on everything that you have done throughout your career? You know, it's like it just started. It just happened. It, it feels fresh. It's interesting. and. Um, You know, you want to do important work, and we did, and that's good. It's a good way to spend your life, and and so that's one thing you should strive to to, to want to do. And and uh, so it's not just about the salary, and and the title, and if you can just divest yourself of that, uh, and surround yourself with smart people, because that makes all the difference in the world. So I've done this work, but I've done it with a lot of folks. And many, and with engineers, and with philosophers, and scientists, and nerd physicists, and and uh, and and just good people that that want to help the next generation. So, so it's been a very good ride. Thank you for sharing that. Is there anything that you'd like to add about? <clears throat> Sorry. <laughs> That's okay. Is there anything you'd like to add about your experiences or anything maybe that I didn't ask about that you'd like to share? Well, I'd, I'd like to encourage people to think outside of their field. If you had asked me when I was a student here at UT Austin, what are you going to do with this degree? I had no clue. I had no clue. And my poor sweet father would say, Mijita, ¿y qué vas a hacer con los esos, esos estudios? You know what? And I'd say, Dad, I, I'm not sure. And uh, so what I would, you know, I, I think it's just to, uh, to figure out whatever gifts you've been given. Mother was big into skills and talents that God would give you. And, and she said, you have to figure out what those gifts are and then how to use them for, for your good, but also for others. So, so really that's, that's finally what it's about, right? I mean, it's, uh, it's, it's being able to use the gifts that you've been given. And only you can finally know what those are. And trying to figure out how to use them on behalf of your family, but also on behalf of the others, and many, many others. And so the greatest gifts I've ever gotten is, you know, from a student that's graduating and uh, a, a kiss or an abrazo or a parent or, I'll be in a store and someone wants me to cut the line and I'll say, no, 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 it's okay. They say, no, no, you handed me my degree 10 years ago. Please go in front of me. You know, just little cariñitos that, that mean a lot to you. So that's, you know, a good life to have lived. Thank you so much, Dr. You're Garcia, welcome. for talking with me today. You're welcome. Thank you for the opportunity.